If you have your Bibles with me this morning, we'd ask you to turn to Exodus. Exodus chapter 34 is where we'll be taking our text this morning. Exodus chapter 34. And we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Exodus chapter 34. In the first verse, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tablets of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. And be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai, and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount, neither let the flocks nor the herds feed before the mount. And he hewed out two tables of stone, like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up unto Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and took, and took in his hand the two tables of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for your precious dear word. Lord, how it speaks to us and how it comforts us as the years fly by. We find it to be the only constant, the only uh, thing that ever changes, and we'll praise you for that. God, this morning we pray that you would uh, draw the saved to yourself and that you would uh, redeem the lost according to your mercy and grace. And we pray these things by the sweet and the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now some so-so familiar verses uh, of Scripture this morning that we'll be reading. Uh, I notice I have it marked in my Bible. I've at least heard it preached once in the last 10 years. And uh, we're going to be preaching on the only answer to sin. The only thing uh, that uh, rebuffs the anger of God. The only thing that will secure you from the wrath of the Almighty. The only thing that will cause you to stand in the day of judgment. That's what we'll be uh, speaking at. And that thing is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. His blood is the only claim that you can make on the day of judgment. And through that, you will stand sinless and spotless before the Lord God Almighty. And so we begin, and if you know where you're at in the history of the people of, of, of God, uh, the Moses had gone up onto the mount and had been up there for 40 days and 40 nights and received the initial law of God. And he wanted, when he came down, Aaron and his bunch had, had created that statue, that idol, that calf, and was worshiping it, and in anger, he threw the tablets down and literally broke the law of God. Now, in that, in that literal breaking of the law of God, he violated the, uh, the law of God as well, the written law of God. Uh, even though he was angry, it wasn't right for Moses to do that. He, 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 uh, he boiled over with anger, and the Lord is never pleased with that. And so we find it's very much a, a, a profound statement that the first law was broken on the first day that it was presented to God's people. And such has it been throughout the history of the world since then, the law, the only useful thing for the law is to be our schoolmaster. A schoolmaster will teach you right from wrong. Uh, a schoolmaster, at least until the last 50 years, would teach you the truth. Uh, they would teach you what to go by. They would teach you a uh, man to man, and this is how a man is a man, and a woman is a woman, and this is how a woman is, and very basic stuff until recently. And so we find that the law was initially broken. Now, sometimes later, and the Lord said unto Moses, 
Hew thee two tablets of stone like unto the first. Now, I want you to see the acquiring of the law of God was not an easy process. Hewing stone is not easy. Uh, that's literally cutting a tablet of stone from rock, from naturally occurring rock. And uh, it takes time, and it takes sledgehammers, and it takes spikes. And it's a great deal of work to prepare the tablets. Now, uh, could God have done that on his own? Absolutely. Uh, but I believe the point is this. Uh, I bet it made it more important to Moses. I bet it made it, in one sense at least to this carnal flesh, more valuable mm -hmm. to Moses to have to do that. You know, uh, when we come to the house of God, we ought to be ready and hew down our own tablets and be ready to receive the word of God. Uh, pre preparation is 90% of what we come down to the house of God uh, for. And if you're prepared, you'll get you'll get out of it what you prepared for it. And if you didn't prepare at all, you won't get nothing. And if you prepared mightily in prayer and even studying before you get here, then certainly you're going to get something out of it. And so we see that for Moses to receive the law of God, he had to do preparatory work to get that done. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hear thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words which were in the first tables which thou breakest. Now, I want you to see, he said, I'm going to give it to you a second time. Isn't it, it wonderful that we have such a merciful God that he replaces the things that we are self-destroy? Um, just like our, just like the inner man, we fell with Adam. You know what? We didn't need his help to be depraved, did we? No. Uh, we, we mess our own selves up. And in mercy and kindness and goodness, God visited us again anyway, even when we don't deserve it. And so we find that the Lord God makes this commitment to Moses and said, I'm going to write them a second time. You come up to me. And uh, verse 2, and be ready in the morning. Again, preparation. You hew the tablets out and be ready. Be, be uh, waiting. Be, be anxious. Be, uh, be receptive in the morning. And we're going to do this a second time. You're going to find the, the character of God a second time in a, a second set of stones. And be ready in the morning. And, and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai. Now, I want you to also get what he's asking of Moses. Now, you should all know the age Moses was when, the, when this occurred, right? He was 80. He had 40 years to wander in the wilderness and in front of him. He died at 120 and this was kind of at the beginning of that. Uh, in fact, uh, he was 80 when he was called. He went before the Pharaoh, and I'm not sure exactly how long that took for him to be freed. Now they were freed. They went through the desert of sin, and now they're on the other side, and they're receiving the law of God. He could have been 82 or 83 by this point. Uh, very close to Brother Junior's age. You know what? Are you ready to go and lead a group of four and a half million people at your age? And then, are you ready to climb a mountain? Yeah. That's, that's what he's asking for. And uh, that, 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 you know what? He didn't quander at the task. That's a lot to ask of a human being that's over 80 years old Simply to spend time with God. At least in our eyes, it's a lot, isn't it? But I would do it, wouldn't you? We, we should have a willingness to, if God guarantees, hey, I'm going to meet with you, that ought to be a very willing thing that we would do, even if it's hard on the flesh, and it is. You know what? You follow the scriptures time and time and time again, 
And when God met with his people, it's insulting or harmful to the flesh. That's, that, that's kind of a... That, you don't hear that a lot today, do you? In fact, it was, it'd be quite the opposite. Most, most doctrines in the modern day would tell you if you still spend time with God, it's good on the flesh. The problem with that, that's not what the Bible teaches, right? And so he says, Moses, I want all this preparatory work for you to do at 80 plus years old. I want you to climb Sinai and I want you to meet me at the top a second time. Lots and lots of preparatory work. Verse 3, and no man shall come up with me. Now, I think there's a couple of reasons why. Uh, first of all, I think um, Moses and Caleb and Joshua were the only redeemed of that group. Of the four and a half million people that were there, there were three elect out of that group. Now, the youngins that came on, on later, there was some saved in them too, I believe. But the adults, every one of them had to die. Now, what is death in and of itself? It's the penalty of sin, is it not? Mm -hmm. And so then we certainly must die as well. And so <clears throat> that rebellious generation had to die out. Now he's asking of uh, these, these people, of Moses, Say, so not only do I want you to come up, I want you to come up alone. Now, three or four years ago, I don't think it was Matthew's wedding. I think it was after that. Maybe it was Matthew's wedding because uh, Andrew was with us, Andrew Trescott. Me and Andrew and Matthew climbed the Roman nose, which is a mountain out in Idaho. And uh, uh, the whole time they were saying, uh, brother uh, Andrew was like, Brother Larry, I didn't think you could do this. And uh, every once in a while, they have to grab me and pull me a little bit. And Matthew's like, God, I, I, I'm impressed. And we got to the top of the mountain. But I often thought if I didn't have Matthew and Andrew with me, would I made it? And so the specific request, the specific demand, really, if you want the law back, you're going to have to do this alone. Now, if you remember, the first time he received the oh, law, Joshua was halfway up with him. And this time, he says, no, I want you to come by yourself. Verse 4. And he, again, obedience, and he hewed two, ta two tables of stone like unto the first, and Moses rose up early, <coughs> in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and he took in his hand the two hand the two tables of stone and the Lord descended now isn't it a wonderful thing that the Lord is always 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 faithful to his promises he says if you'll come I'll meet you there if you, if you climb the mountain, I'll be there when you get there. You know what? Uh, what a wonderful, rich truth. God has never failed us. God has never let us down. Now, we may perceive that sometime, but I will guarantee you this. You're wrong. God has never, ever, ever let his people down in any way, shape, matter, or form. So all this effort Moses put out was well rewarded. When he got to the top, he met with the presence of the Almighty, the great God, Jehovah, and he was faithful to his promise and said, I'll be there. Uh, I, I'll meet you uh, when you put out this effort. You know what? I fully believe this morning when we put out the right kind of effort that God's going to meet with us. He said, two, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there will I be in the midst. Now, you know the qualifier there. You hear that preached in uh, especially churches that are on the way down, so to speak. But you know what? He said, where two or three are gathered together in my name. Yeah. See, the preparatory work. Be, being prepared to hear from God, being genuine in that meet. 
He said, then and there will I be in the midst. And so Moses did all that preparatory work, 80 plus years old, doing the bidding of God, and he was there and richly, richly rewarded. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there. Now, I think that's an amazing thing. Remember, uh, in another place, uh, Moses said, I just want to see. He, he said, I just want to see you. If it kills me, it kills me. I just want to see you. And the Lord God said, uh, you can't see me and live. He said, but I'll let you see the hundred parts. You ever thought about that? Why, why that was exactly um, you? Uh, he said, I'll walk by you. And the hundred parts, you know, back here, it's really the result. God moves through. And we get, we get to enjoy the results. We get to see the results. Now, we're not, always, we're not always looking for them, but we do see them. And, and we look for rich blessing and pleasant things, but that doesn't mean that God's moved through, does it? We, we want to accept it that way. Yeah. But you know what? Sometimes when God moves through, through huh. a wave of destruction is behind it. <laughs> We was spending a little time working on Brother Junior's garage yesterday. You know what? Despite all the work you guys have put in, that was a move of the Almighty. And cramped somewhere in that little closet, God proved his provision. <clears throat> See what I'm saying? We, we look at it all wrong, do we not? And, and, and so we find that, that Moses... Uh, gets this wonderful experience and here the presence of God is veiled it is veiled he doesn't see him you, you really need to see this so you don't think God uh, that God uh, violates himself and the Lord descended in a cloud he was he was he was covered with that veil he didn't look directly at the person of the Almighty and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and what? Proclaim the name of the Lord. Now, I want you to see every time God's people meet ought to be in that the proclaiming of God's word. <coughs> proclaiming, let's say, proclaim the name of the Lord. That ought to be done every time we meet. Yeah. You know what? I can remember when I was a boy, and I'm sure many of you can too, except maybe my children, because they've heard it most of their life. It was very rarely, if ever, you heard the name of Jehovah mentioned. That's right. Uh, and the reason why this bunch of stinking Rothschilds about took it from us, did they not? I, I mean, I remember not even knowing. Uh, we just called him God. That's Jehovah Jireh, the God of the Bible. And it says that he came down and met with Moses and declared the things of the Lord. You know what? I, I believe he's faithful to that. When, when we come with a faithful, uh, uh, anxious heart, I believe he'll meet with us. And so we see that the presence of the Almighty came down to meet with God's people, to meet with Moses specifically. And the Lord passed by before him, verse 6, and the Lord passed by before him, and what was the proclamation? And proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God. Now, I personally believe, in, for whatever it's worth, that the Lord is the Lord Jesus. Uh, way back in eternity past, when he prepared to make the world, he said, let us, right. more than one individual, and I think even then, it was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Because, about, you know what the Bible says? And the Spirit moved across the waters. See, the Holy Ghost was active in the creation of all that you see around here this morning. Isn't that an amazing thought? Yeah. That, and, and so we find that as the praise begins, it says the Lord, and then it says the Lord God. So I think it was Jesus, and then uh, God the Father, Jehovah, that's what he was saying. You know what's tied up in the law? The person of Christ and the person of the great God of the Bible. That's what's tied up in the law. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, 
Now notice his wonderful characteristics. Merciful and gracious. Isn't it a wonderful thing <laughs> that God don't just stamp us out? Yeah. It really is. That, that, that's the right thing to do, right? That's the righteous thing to do is stamp us out. Remember, <laughs> that was even the desire of the Almighty. And, and Moses went <laughs> and Moses went as an advocate for his people and said, listen, God, if you do this, uh, you're going to have a bad testimony. They're going to say, for this reason, you took them out here just to slay them. And uh, uh, thank God for his mercy. Amen. Now, you ever thought of how much you deserve the judgment of God? I tell you what, if you do, it'll make salvation much, much more precious to you. Now. And, 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 and uh, as Brother Garrett's Sunday school lesson this morning, <laughs> it'll get that nose out of the air and get you down to where you can share the gospel with anybody that'll listen, right? And, and, and so we see his attributes are proclaimed. Merciful and gracious, long-suffering, waiting and waiting and waiting, uh, and abundant in goodness, and truth. Now, I, I love that, abundant in both those items, goodness and abundant in truth. You think about how much more you understand about this precious word than you did, say, 30 years ago. It's amazing, is it not? Yeah. And, and you, know, you know why that is and how you can look on things a little deeper than you used to? Because it's abundant. And you know what? I dare to say if I live another 30 years, which I sincerely doubt, but if I all about, if I eyeballed 83, 30 years from now, you know what? My thoughts then is even then it'll still be abundant and good, and I'll be learning more than I know now. And, and I believe that's why the Bible calls this in the New, in the New Testament a living word, uh, a word that is regenerative, uh, a word that keeps going. And so he makes this promise. But notice verse 7, good and bad, keeping mercy for thousands. That's specific, is it not? He doesn't have that for everybody. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin that and that will by no means clear the guilty. Now that's, that, that's, if there is a problem with the law, or maybe an inadequacy of the law, all this that he just said, said it would no way clear the guilty. See, that's the limitations of good behavior, is it not? That's the limitations. That's why the Pharisees and Sadducees that Jared taught us about this morning, they, and they came with their good works. It was still not there. Yeah. It, it still wasn't enough. Now, if you know this, it says, to the third and fourth generation. Now, that seems like there would be a stop, right? In this room this morning, we have four generations of the Page clan. Three generations of the Lafferty clan. And you know what? Uh, now, it's hard for me to see it. <laughs> but I'm sure it's not hard for their parents to see it. Uh, it's very hard for me to see the condition of man in my grandchildren. But I know it's there. Mm. Those are my grandchildren. That's the third generation. And if I live to see their children, it'll be there too. And you say, well, that'll wind it up. No, no. Because see... Those children that, that would be my great-grandchildren will be Adam's, Sarah's grandchildren. And it all starts all over again. The third and fourth. See, the third and fourth generation never stops. The other day, and I was excited about it, and you, you all know I like genealogy, and I found out my fourth great-grandparents. And I was looking at that, and I began to think, you know what? They were just as wicked as I am. And we've carried that from generation to generation to generation. And here it is today, still the very same thing. And so the law 
as our schoolmaster described who we were from the inside out. Mm -hmm. Just as wicked and vile as we can be. But praise be unto the Lord, the story doesn't stop there. Uh, if it did, oh, we'd be a people most miserable, would we not? But notice in 1 Peter, everybody tries to teach that uh, Peter was a, a works for salvation man, and he wasn't, no more than I am. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in uh, verse 18. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 18, Servants, be subject to you masters with all fear. Now, uh, a lot of people will use this, and I, I mean, it is what it is. I'm not saying it's not. That it's a validation of slavery. And it is. I mean, uh, we can say what we will, but even the law itself had provision for slaves. Not saying that we should pick that business back up, but it wasn't wicked and vile as Abraham Lincoln would have us to believe it was. Now, with that said, also, you are a servant. If you're among the redeemed, you are bought with a price. And so we don't have a choice, do we? If God says to go, we must go. If the master said, get to the cotton field, you know what the result was? You went to the cotton field or you got a good licking. That was the two choices. And you know, uh, that's a problem with many parents today. When I was a boy, if mother said, go, Larry, come on the grass, there were two choices. I could go to the grass and get her mowed or I could get a licking. And you know what? After the licking, the grass get mowed anyway. Right? Right. Yeah. And, and, and so we see then that uh, this, uh, this text that Peter writes to us, it's for us. We're servants. There's no choice in this. We are slaves. Servants, be subject to your masters with all what? Fear. See, in the realm of grace, in the modern day preachers and teachers say there's no reason to fear God. There's no bigger lie out of hell. I fear Him unbelievably. Because you know what? <laughs> he has the power. You know what? And, and I understand sovereignty. I think I do, at least some. But I believe you can shorten your days. Uh, I, in fact, I know, I know you can, according to the Bible. If you don't honor your mother and daddy, the Bible says... <laughs> that your days would be short. <laughs> well, actually, it says, Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee and that thy days may be long upon the earth. We can, I guess, actually, in that sense, lengthen our days, right? Just, be, just honoring that office. And, and so we find in this text that should make us fearful. Someone that holds your life in his hands does that make, not make you fearful? Does that not make you reverent? That's what it's saying. Servants be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, meaning the good and gentle master, but also to the forward or the mean or the demanding. Be good, be subject to both. For this is thankworthy. You know, I think that's an unusual word to put there, don't you? Authored by God, written by man. Are you thankful for your situation this morning? Sometimes I fail to be, do you not? A lot of us would like to have more money. Let me tell you, that you, you'll never satisfy that. Be thankful for what you do have. Yeah. Yeah. Be thankful for what you do have. And, and, and certainly that's what he was saying. For the situation that I have created for you, you being a slave to me, be glorious about it. Be, well, thank God for that. And you know why? Because he bought me with a price. If he didn't buy me with a price and make me a slave, I would still be on my way to hell this morning. And so I'm not, and I'm thankful. Blessed be his name. I, I, I'll serve him. The best that I can. That's right. For 
this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Now I want you to say, he said, I want you to endure grief. And you know what? Sometimes I've suffered wrongfully. Have you ever asked, why is this happening? You're not, you're not suffering in the right way. Suffering, thank you, worthy. Well, thank you, God, for putting me in this situation. It hurts like the Dickens, but thank you for putting me in there. Man, is that not hard to do? That, that, that is a very, very difficult thing to do. And you ask Donna and my girls, my hearing is getting worse every day. And I'm like, I cannot go deaf. How will I provide for this bunch if I go deaf? It's not very thankworthy, is it? You know how I'd be thankworthy? I can see well. <laughs> it may take all four eyes to get it done, but I can see well. <laughs> thankworthy. So in a slave situation, instead of making yourself miserable and making yourself mad at the world, be thankworthy. That, that's a hallmark of the redeemed. Verse 20. For what glory is it, and that's a glory to God, for what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall not take it patiently? You, you, you don't Enjoy it. You don't endure it. You, you fuss about it. You grumble about it. You cuss about it. But if, when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently. Thus is the acceptable will of God. Not anything to write home about. Nothing gracious. Just acceptable. If you endure grief, would blessed be the name of the Lord, just run of the mail if, you want, if you're where you should be with Christ. Verse 21, For even hereunto were ye called. Y'all know Romans 28. For all things work to get together for good to them that are loved the Lord, for them that are called according to His purpose. And it goes on and touches the called and the redeemed. You know what you were called to do? To suffer. Yeah. That's, that's not real pleasant, is it? That, that's not cartwheel preaching, but according to this, it's true. You know why we suffer here? We're not home yet. That's right. You know what pilgrims do? You know, when we think of pilgrims, you think of people dressed like Amish people, right? You know what they did? They suffered. They came to this land that was not their own and literally were attacked by the natural inhabitants. The first colony, the colony of Roanoke, ceased to exist because of the attacks of the natural people, the Indians that lived here. You know what? The natural species in this land is the sinner, and he will attack us and attack us because we don't belong here. And that is the pilgrims that we are. And so as Peter's writing uh, this general letter to many, many churches, a consistent problem, a consistent situation, he says, you're called to this slavery life. For even hereunto are you called because Christ has suffered for us this is why it's so much better than the law. Christ also, also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Right. Did Jesus go willingly? You betcha. In fact, remember when Peter was doing the big eye thing and said, uh, uh, let it be not so, Lord, he said, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. That's right. And you know why? It was an effort to divert the plan of God. See, even Christ in, in his mortal flesh 
very, very obedient to the Father. And if that be the case, should we not be as well? Church, it's not going to get better. Uh, we're approaching the end, I hope. But you know what? I certainly don't know that. Uh, so it might, go, it might go from worse to worse, sir. You know what? We should abide as, uh, we, we should take it as servants. If that's what God wants, let's get to it. <coughs> We're in for uh, the rest of verse 20. And suffered for it, ye take it patiently. This is, the accept this is acceptable with God. Take it patiently. You know what I found? Just say like I'm, I, I, you know what? When I give a shot at work, it don't hurt me a bit. I'm good at it, and pot, and squir squish the juice home, and we're done. But when I'm on the other end of the needle, I said, do it quick. You don't want someone to go and give you one of these, and I've had them that way, and they're not pleasant. You can feel every fiber as it's going by, and I'm like, just give me a shot, right? You know what? When, when, when those shots come with this life, endure it patiently. If the spiritual nurse wants to go, let it be done. Right? <coughs> let it be done. And, and so with that, certainly trials are going to come, but the redeemed should rejoice in it, and the redeemed should give him praise for it, and the redeemed shall under, should understand why it's happening. Verse 21. For here unto are you called, called to this service, called for these punishment. But Christ, Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, no inflammatory response, no anger coming out for him, who, when he was reviled, Revolved not again. Didn't, didn't say anything. You know, that is in essence why before the Sanhedrin and before Pilate, when he was trying to, Pilate, instead of Pilate, he marveled that he didn't speak. This is why. And we're to be like Christ. When they're throwing it all at you, stand there. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he was suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Commit yourself to God. You're going to get in a bad shape in this life? You bet you. You're going to be soft, falsely judged? Yeah. You're going to be falsely accused? Absolutely. Wait for God's judgment. It's righteous. It's good. And on the merit of Christ, you will be home with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the wonderful part. Who in his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we, being dead in sin, should live under righteousness by whose stripes ye are healed. Lost people, I point you to Christ this morning. According to this, he finished it. It's done. Is the life going to be pleasant? Absolutely not. But there is a remedy to sin. Where Moses ended, and that, that judgment at the end of verse 7 still existed, here it stops. Do you know Christ? Do you fear judgment? Do you understand and know the sufficiency of Christ? Verse 25, For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd, meaning Christ, notice capital S, shepherd there, and bishop, big B, bishop, meaning Christ himself, of your souls. Isn't that a wonderful thing this morning? Yeah. Don't, ever, don't ever flip out about the word bishop. You know what it means? It means pastor. <laughs> He's He's the bishop. He's the caretaker. A bishop means caretaker of your souls. 
So I ask you this morning in verse 24 where it says, He bore it for us. Do you, do you understand that? What a rich and wonderful gospel truth that we don't have to dread that. That whipping and that judgment described in Exodus 34 verse 7, it doesn't have to be the end of the story. It could just be the beginning. Man. Mm -hmm. He done it for us. Mm -hmm. He saves. He saves even today. Do you know him? You know, the Bible says very clearly, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Sinner friend, my advice to you, seek the Lord with everything you buy. That's not Armenian, that's Bible. He's the answer to everything else. And then after he saves you, your life's going to be miserable. <laughs> You know, you hear this, you hear this new age preacher, oh, it'd be so wonderful. Well, Lord saved me over 40 years ago and the wonderful hadn't started yet, right? The only wonderful I have is eternal home in heaven. <laughs> That's the only wonderful I have. Uh, do you know him? That's, That's the only question that matters. 